Okay, time. It's it's start. Everyone. Oh, hello everyone. This is workshop uh, uh workshop number one four nine. Uh, VOD regulations, fair contribution, and local content contribution. Okay. So let's start the workshop. Oh, I wanted to. Oh uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, here are the speakers of these sessions. Local speakers from here are venue from he here in Tokyo, uh, Kyoto. Yeah, Dr. Nami Yonetani. And uh, I'm Ichiro Mizukose. I'm uh, also the session uh, organizer of this, this session. And remote speakers, Dr. Toshia Jitsuzumi from New York. Can you hear me? Oh. Yes, I can hear you, but I'm not from New York. I'm from DC. Wow, <laughs> yeah, thank you. And Mr. Miss Cho Shang from Seoul, can you hear me? Hello. Hello. I can't hear you. Hello. Ah, it's okay. I can hear you. Yeah. All right. Oh, each one's background will be talked about in their presentations. So. Yep. Today we discussed about two regulations. One is fair contributions and the other is the local content contributions. Uh, this is very, very rough explanation of these regulations. Fair contribution is redistributing the money from DV, uh, VOD to investigate the telecommunication infrastructures such as uh, fibers and the towers and so, etc. And the local content contribution is redistributing the money from the VOD to the uh, from now uh, from VOD to produce the local content and ordering them to promote the local content. Again, this is very, very rough explanations. So after this workshop, I hope everyone gets the more correct understanding of these regulations. So uh, we want to make this works workshop uh, a bit uh, interactive with polling system by slider. So if you have an uh, internet access, please uh, access the slider the, with code 39650076 and the, click the URL that posted here now. Just a moment. Shut. Yeah, I'm sending the URL. If you post, could you uh, click that URL and make the polling. Oops, I'm sorry. What's going on? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, this is a practice, and so now. Please uh, choose one. Uh, before this workshop, uh, we want to know the, your background. Have you ever had a fair contribution? or on the local content contribution, or both, or none. It's a, just wait for a polling. Yes. Oh, no. OK, polling is coming. Just a moment. Share the slide to the result. Yeah, on still five people are voting. Oh, everybody knows about this session. Oh no, or one knows only fair contributions. Ah, uh, one knows nothing. No, okay. So now. This is a practice, so I switch to the real polling now. Just a moment. Yep. Oh, this is, I want to hear your opinion about, it's a too little, but you can see it in your display. Just a moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, no. 
the moment for it. Got that. Which also I wrote out. Okay, uh, this is a question that, wait a moment, curious methods, find it changes things. The polling question is, do you think the government should make rules for VODs to distribute some of their profit with local telecom industry or the local content industry or both local telecom and the content industry or none of them. So if you, even if you live in the middle of the workshop, please poll and you can edit or just change the poll at any time. Okay? Oh, I sh will show you the result at the end of the sessions. So go back to the agenda. Uh, here's today's agenda. First, Toshio Jizuzumi will uh, about, talk about the fair contribution. Next, Aichiro Mizukoshi talk in the case study in Japan. Then, Ms. Cho shows the situation in Korea. And finally, Dr. Yonetani give a presentation about local content contribution. At our presentations, we have a time of Q&A and discussion. So, now, Ms. Professor Jizuzumi, please, is it okay? Okay. First, let me share my slides. Yeah, I stopped the slide, right. You see my slide? Yeah, we can see it. Okay, so let me start. Hello, uh, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jitsumi of Chu University and currently staying at uh, Georgetown University and enjoying my sabbatical leave here. Well, I deeply regret not having the chance to meet you in person at Kyoto, but I'm grateful for this opportunity to present a brief summary of fair contribution debate. But let me first uh, introduce myself very briefly. After an 18 year tenure at the Japanese Telecom Authority, the Ministry of Tele International Affairs and Communications, I am now a faculty member at Chu University and teach microeconomics focusing on network industries. And my research, uh, uh, recent research includes net neutrality, AI regulation, platform regulation, fragmentation of the internet, and fair contribution, which is a central theme of today's panel discussion, I think. All right, uh, let me uh, summarize three backgrounds that have ignited the discussion on the fair uh, contribution so far. The first is, of course, the remarkable surge in global internet usage. This phenomenon is notably driven by the rapid expansion of internet video usage, which according to Cisco estimate in 2018 has quadrupled in consumer usage and tripled in business usage over the last five years since 2017. As you can easily understand, this escalating internet usage imposes a substantial strain on the operation of underlying network. According to the estimate of Frontier Economics, the cost to European broadband network can range from billions to tens of, tens of billions of euros per year. Facing such robust surge in network utilization, telecom operators worldwide are channeling considerable investment into their network to uphold and where possible augment the quality of internet experience for their users. However, in Japan, the growth in investment by telecom carriers has not resulted in a proportionate improvement in network quality, leading to challenges in offering enhanced broadband services that need higher network standards. As my research in the 2010s reveals, as displayed in this slide, especially the left hand side, network investments of the Japan operators initially led to notable improvement in latency and then gradual enhancement in effective download speeds. Unfortunately, as the right hand side graph shows, download percentage, which is a ratio of effective speed, I mean actual speed to advertised speed, has been declining, indicating that the Japanese telecom operators need to further expand the investment size in order to accommodate the demand of broadband users. As you can easily understand, this situation is just one example of the difficulties faced by telecom operators in many countries and which is one of the biggest background of the fair contribution controversy. 
The second one relates to the fact that in most countries, there still remains a substantial digital divide or digital gap in the rural and poor areas. In its 2019 report, the Broadband Commission, which was established by IT and UNESCO, underscored the lingering global digital gap and calls for additional investment of network operators, which of course include OTT players. The third one pertains to the sustainability of universal service mechanisms. Currently, many governments bear the responsibility of ensuring essential telecom services for the citizen. This policy necessitates the provision of support to network operators which supply services in unprofitable remote regions. And the funds that support this subsidy mechanism are often collected from users of very basic voice services. However, unfortunately, the proliferation of broadband has led to significant decline in voice service demand, raising concerns about long-term sustainability of such subsidy scheme. Therefore, in the US, this has prompted discussion, as you can see in this slide, regarding alternative funding sources, which I believe can be very compatible with a fair contribution concept. In order to address these uh, three challenges, operators must find new sources of revenue. But in the real world, numerous constraints curtail their capacity to freely pursue this quest. First, telecom carriers are usually bounded by rate and uh, entry restrictions originally attributable to their natural monopolistic nature. Second, considering the pivotal role of telecom services, even legally permissible actions may encounter political constraints. A notable example involves a significant reduction in mobile prices in Japan following an influential political statement of the chief cabinet secretary at that time, who then became our prime minister. Third, as shown in the graph on the right, the average revenue per users has diminished in recent years, indicating that any fee increase can risk significant user attrition. Fourth, in an area where IoT devices are penetrating all around us, acquiring additional frequencies or frequency licenses is imperative for telecom operators, demanding further investment to secure frequency licenses and ultimately thin the financial resources for physical network maintenance. As a result, telecom carrier expansion strategy realistically, realistically shrinks to just two options. First, augmenting revenue by introducing non-telecom services. I think this is eagerly pursued by Japanese mobile operator right now. Second, charging additional network usage fees on OTT operators that utilize broadband networks for content distribution and make money which is, of course, the heart of the fair contribution debate. The debate about fair contribution has gained additional momentum due to the noticeable difference in profits between OTT and telecom operators. This contrast is clearly illustrated in a report by GSMA, a group of mobile operators, which states that while telecom operated profit has been declining, OTT operators continue to make high profit. Yet, the theoretical remedy for this issue is remarkably straightforward. The crux of the matter lies in the reality that network expansion by telecom operators inherently benefits OTT players, yet the compensation growing from OTT operators is inadequate. Other things is external economic profile is important to avoid underinvestment by telecom operators. The resolution, in theory, involves two approaches. The first entails appropriate taxation of OTT operators. This is an approach proposed uh, by economist Arthur Pigou and known as Piguvian tax. The second revolves around the direct negotiation between relevant parties, in our case, between the telecom operators and OTT players. This approach was suggested by another economist, Nobel laureate Ronald Coase. Other economists, it is a great pleasure for me to say that the economic theory produced such a very elegant pair of solutions. But I have to remind you that we should not forget that the existence of another externalities. Investment by OTT players in content application can drive greater demand for broadband services, resulting in a positive external effect on telecom carriers. In order to properly deal with this externality, 
telecom operators need to pay compensation to OTKs in return. So given this dual existence of externalities, determining whether OTKs or telecom operators bear the burden uh, based on the case-by-case -case analysis. Although theoretical solutions are so simple, translating them into practice presents significant challenges, of course. First, the majority of interconnection agreements that make up today's global internet are either settlement-free peering, where nobody pays the usage of other, other network, or unidirectional transit agreement where lower tier network always pays the upper tier. Clearly, both of them do not work well with the regime that enforces payment based on network usage. Second, for Peruvian tax and Corsair method to succeed, participant parties must possess, uh, must possess sufficient information of the surrounding situation and can reach consensus without much difficulties. But achieving them in the dynamic broadband landscape is exceedingly difficult. Last but, least, but not least, theoretical resolutions can clash with net neutrality principles. Since net neutrality prohibits network operators from charging users outside direct contractual relationship and forbids QoS differentiation. So under the strict net neutrality, fair contribution cannot be realized. Europeans notably recognize these issues ahead of the global car. And just before the World Conference on International Telecommunication in 2012, European operators considered introducing a new approach, sending party network pay to reshape interconnection dynamics, which consists of peering and transit. However, this proposal encounters substantial opposition and did not formally proceed to the international fora. And after this attempt, we have decades of stagnation for this SPNP discussion. However, probably influenced by the development in Korea, which I think will be explained by my fellow panelists, SPNP discussion began to resurface. Currently, Europe has published a proposal that calls for stakeholders, all stakeholders, to make a fair and proportionate contribution to the cost of public goods, services, and infrastructure as a means of achieving the universal gigabit, gigabit coverage by 2030. Of course, this proposal sparks ongoing debate with counter arguments such as a concern of tighter regulation of broadband, disproportionate usage charges, and potential negative impact on broadband adoption. And while policymakers, industry representatives, and academia from various countries were engaged in heated discussion here, shocking news came on September 18 of this year. That is, after three years of heated disagreement, SK Broadband Netflix suddenly announced a ceasefire and ended the lawsuit. The detailed terms of the agreement are still unclear, but in any case, the situation in Korea seems to have been settled to a point. But very interestingly, however, the issue of fair contribution is hardly discussed in the neighboring countries across the Sea of Japan. Several hypotheses are possible. The first one is that Japanese carriers have already installed a network of excessive capacity and coverage so that the impact of internet video traffic is not severe. In fact, the average speed of over 80 megabit per second as of 2019 is sufficient for video viewing and the fiber optic network has achieved more than 99.7% coverage nationwide. Therefore, there may be no need to ask OTT operators to fund a new investment at this stage. However, this situation is limited to the investment expenditure and has no explanatory power regarding operating and renewal cost of the network. Furthermore, capital investment will continue to be required for mobile network because the mobile traffic is expected to skyrocket with 5G. As a result, I think this hypothesis alone is not sufficient. Second, because of a high degree of oligopoly in the Japanese telecom market, existing network operators have long been earning sufficient profit and thus do not feel the need to ask OTT to share the cost. At the very least, I feel this explanation applies well on the three large, largest companies, NTT, KDDA, and SoftBank. On the other hand, 
This has limited explanatory, explanatory power with regard to small and medium-sized players, which are less profitable. The last but not the least hypothesis is that Japanese mobile operators heavily utilize Wi-Fi offloading in order to manage the huge, huge amount of traffic, especially in the peak times. Thus, if they loudly claim fair contribution, they may end up paying large usage fee to fixed network operators. Whether either of these hypotheses can explain the unique situation in Japan, which differs uh, very, uh, very different from that of Korea, uh, this is a topic of, for my future empirical research. All right, let's turn on the focus on the Japanese telecom authorities. The Japanese telecom authorities have pondered the fairness of cost distribution within the context of net neutral discussions, but has yet to implement definitive actions. Even the recent amendment of Telecom Business Act which identified broadband as the universal services failed to incorporate the mechanism to procure necessary costs from OTT players. So as a researcher, I maintain key interest in the Japan's forthcoming decisions. With that, I conclude my presentation. Your attention is deeply appreciated, and now I yield the floor. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Professor Jizuzumi. So the next presenter is me, just a moment. Yes. And I send the URL again, so please poll your opinion. Yep. Just a moment, please. Yes. Okay, oh, let me start my presentation with a case study in Japan about these two regulations for VODs. First of all, oh, yeah. so uh, my name is Ichiro Mizukoshi. I'm an internet engineer, especially for the operation of packet forwarding and security. I'm working for NTT East and also the external board of the JPSATCC. But uh, this presentation is solely my opinion and doesn't show my company's position, okay? Let's skip here. Yeah, first of all, uh, VOD is also give growing in Japan. This is market size of VOD in Japan. It grew by 18% in these three years and reached $3.5 billion in year 2020, uh, 2022. And here's a detail, oh, no, 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 yeah, yeah. VOD is getting more popular in Japan. Seven years ago, only 15% of the people had used the VOD, but now almost 40% have used it. And this is, here's a detail of the Japanese S-Bot, a uh, subscribed video on demand market. Yeah, familiar global VOD players, uh, VOD players such as Netflix, Amazon, Prime, Dazoon, Disney Plus, and Full. Oh, those of them then have share more than half of the market. Then, how is it? Uh, how about these two regulations are going in Japan? As Professor Jitsumi said, yeah, fair, co fair contributions is very inactive, and also the local <coughs> content contribution is also um, inactive. Of course, uh, I'm an in ISP industry guy, so fair contribution is occasionally talks in the ISP in industries, what's going on the EU, or the, how about the trial in the Korea is going. But uh, there is no concrete actions has occurred as, fa as far as I know. And about the local content contribution, I'm not a content industry person, but based on my understanding, this topic is rarely discussed in Japan, partially because broadcasting regulations are non-existent. Oh, so, yep, why? It, yep, it's my humble opinion. Uh, there are three reasons adding to it. For this is means hypothesis. Uh, government, it's a government, the government stance, uh, market size, and the numerous stakeholders. First, government stands to the big day. The Japanese government has a much more uh, restrained stance compared to the EU. Here are the two recent activities in Japan. First one is requesting 
request for registration in Japan. Oh, the companies that do business in Japan are legally required to register not only their local arm, but also their global headquarters with authorities here. But such request has occurred. It means uh, before June 20, uh, 2022, uh, even Microsoft, Google, and Meta, such a global company, uh, big tech, had not registered in Japan, just requested, and some of them are going out, but almost them are uh, registered now. And the second one is uh, just subject to the regulation. This year, search engines and social media with more than 10 million users are newly subject to the regulation. But there's no heavy point to find like now you. Uh, Japanese government take the mostly act, uh, name and shame approaches. If I may add, those two activities mainly focus on the promoting, uh, protecting the pa personal information. So they not so much care about the market movement and so on. So anyway, this approach is much more restrained. The second one is, uh, as this Misan also mentioned, but the market side, as I showed in the previous slide, the VOD market is uh, 3.5 billion, but related industries such as telecommunications, televisions, and video production, compared to VOD, uh, these three industries are order of magnitude larger. The fine last uh, opinion uh, finding is numerous stakeholders. It's not easy to define the ISP. However, assigning IP addresses to the customer is a core function of ISP. Currently, over, fi over 500 organizations in Japan have been delegated IP address blocks to assign to their customers. Yes, uh, it's including hosting, crowds, and so on. However, a fairly large number of ISP exist in Japan. And the television stations, there are so many television stations in Japan. Tesla is one, more than 120, and the cable stations 450, and satellites are 40 or more. And the all size, oh, and the size of these stakeholder ISP and television se sectors, is, uh, television sectors, is too widely defined. Large one targets the national market, and the small one targets the rural village. So it's too hard to discuss the issue in one table. So uh, the, it means there are too many stakeholders to cope with the VOD, VOD industry together. Oh, in addition, that is in the VOD industry itself, there are various domestic players. It's like also the kind of the reasons, I think. Yeah, um, this is my last uh, slide. I have been thinking about the fair contribution for more than 10 years and so on. And this statement significantly impacted me. In year 2010s, my friend, the executive of mobile, op uh, executives of mobile operators said, we charge end users based on the volume or budget. So OTT is a goose that lays a golden egg for us. I think this is an important message to the whole world. Yeah, thank you. So let's pass to the next presentation, Ms. Cho, please. Okay. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, I'm here. Okay. Yes, okay. Uh, I'll start. Hello, I'm Chang Cho, a research fellow at KDDI Research. Thank you for joining our workshop. My research focus on the broadcasting, ICT, and related policies. I have been writing about Korean ICT transfer various magazine of UKBP, uh, affiliate of newspaper, BK newspaper in Japan. Today, I will be speaking about fair contribution and a local content contribution in Korea. Korean dramas, K-pop, and various other contents are gaining popularity in the world these days. Korea is not only a great content creator, but also an internet powerhouse. 
It was the first country in the world to spread broadband to ordinary households, and it had the highest broadband penetration rate among OECD member countries in 2022. It, in, it created new industries such as internet broadcasting, online game tournaments, and webtoons. When it comes to the internet, there are many instances where Korean starts first and influences the rest of the world. A recent example of this is debate over network fees. In Korea, platforms have usually paid network fees for ISPs. It has been taken for granted that both users and service providers pay for the network. And there are many companies that uh, want to provide services in Korea, but there are only four ISPs in Korea. The situation has changed when global big tech companies like Google, YouTube, and Netflix uh, launched their services in Korea. With the majority, majority of Korean internet users using Google, YouTube, and Netflix on a daily basis, the platform began to become more powerful than ISPs. In April 2020, Netflix filed a lawsuit against SK Broadband, a Korean ISP which had a significant impact on the fair contribution debate in Korea. First, let's briefly explain what the lawsuit was about. Netflix asked the Seoul Central Court to rule that it was not obligated to negotiate or pay network fees for the delivery of content over SK Broadband's domestic and international networks and for the operation and expansion of these networks. Netflix argued network neutrality, but the Seoul Central Court ruled the June 2021 that Network neutrality is a principle that prohibits telephone companies from unreasonably discriminating against local traffic on their network and is not directly relevant to the network fee discussion. The court also recognized that Netflix was obligated to pay SK Broadband for the paid service of accessing, connecting to, and remaining content connect, connected to SK Broadband networks. The court also ruled that the two companies should negotiate how the network fees will be paid. Korean media reported that Netflix was in court and that all business with service in Korea must pay network fees. To understand how Netflix lawsuit against the SK Broadband began and why Korean court upheld network fees, we need to go back to 2006. In 2006, Korean ISP Hanada Telecom launched Hana TV, an um, IPTV service that allow, allows users to stream video over the internet with a set-up box on their TV. It was the first IPTV in Korea and gained a lot of popularity due to convenience of being able to watch Royalty on TV using remote control. However, other ISPs did not like this and shut down HANA TV, claiming that it increased the traffic of subscribers who were using HANA TV VOD. HANA TV is currently still in service as SK Broadband VTV. By registering the Internet Multimedia Broadcasting Business Act in February 2008, KT, SK Broadband, and LG U Plus which are uh, both telecom companies and ISPs, and should close the IPTV services for their own subscribers. With these three companies offering combined internet, phone, and IPTV discounts, most households now subscribe on IPTV. In 2012, Samsung Electra's newly launched released smart TV become a problem. When a service merger that allows smart TV to access royalty from various companies, the ISP KT blocked the Samsung smart TV from accessing KT internet, citing increased traffic. Or smart TV ended up paying network fees to ISP or paying something if it wasn't called the network fees. Then in 2016, Netflix launched 
in Korea. And subscribers started grow, and YouTube users skyrocketed. Naver, a portal platform with the most users in Korea, raised the issue of network fee. Naver asked ISP to disclose how much YouTube paid for network fees, which account for 70.8% of video viewing time in Korea. Naver argued that network fee that uh, strictly applied to the Korean companies, but not to global companies, are problematic. The National Assembly also said that it was not fair to discriminate between Korean companies and global companies. The debate started over paying network fees fairly. The discussion on fair contribution to internet network maintenance and investment began honest. As Netflix subscribers grew, so did the traffic for Netflix VOD. When Netflix launched in Korea, two of the countries, ISP KT and LG U Plus, partnered the to make uh, Netflix available using their IPTV remote instead of May network fee. They chose to share the, e the profit when their subscribers signed up Netflix. SK Broadband decided to take network fee. Starting in 2018, SK Broadband expanded its network because it felt that the traffic from Netflix subscribers was damaging users who didn't describe to Netflix. Since it expanded its network for Netflix, it proposed to Netflix that Netflix should share the cost 50-50. Netflix insisted on installing Open Connect inside SK Broadband facilities, claiming that it could reduce 95% of traffic. SK Broadband refused and saying that Open Connect would not solve the problem and asked the Korean Communication Commission to mediate to make Netflix negotiate the network fee. Netflix rejected that arbitration and asked the court to rule that it did not have to pay the network fee and did not have to negotiate. The result was a de facto defeat for Netflix. In September 2021, SK Board was sued Netflix under the unjust enrichment provision of Civil Act. It claimed that Netflix had ignored the first judgment, refused to pay network fees, and to negotiate. Netflix appeared in December 2021. Netflix insisted that SK Broadband could not bill Netflix for the increased traffic because it is charged based on internet speed to their subscribers. Google and YouTube cited the Netflix. The National Assembly was considering a law change that would require CPs to sign contracts with ISP stating that they must pay for network uses, which they opposed. In September 2023, Netflix, SK Telecom, and SK Broadband formed a strategic partnership and ended all litigation. The three companies announced that they would work together for good of their users. Korean media reported that following reasons for the end of the litigation. Network, Netflix would have paid SK Broadband for its network behind closed doors because it was likely to lose on appeal. And sitting president would have triggered, have triggered lawsuit in other countries. Experts calculated Netflix network fees, which could have been up $180 million. In Korea, why do we have to pay ISPs for network fees? Korean Telecommunication Business Act defines interconnection as paid peering by default. Interconnection between ISPs is also paid peering. ISPs are connected on, contracted on deal and keep basis, so they don't pay each other, but it's not free. In Korea, there are only four ISPs, but there are many OTTs. 
the most popular OTT in Korea is Netflix. In September 2023, it was reported that more Koreans use Netflix than all other Korean OTT combined. For ISPs, the most important question is what kind of agreements they have with Netflix to address network fees and fair contribution issues. Korean ISPs are working with European telecom companies who have the same concerns. In Europe, the majority are to of traffic is dominated by a handful of big tech companies. But even in Korea, some people are questioning network fees. Civic groups argue that subscribers pay for internet every month and ISP also collect network fee from service providers. This is like a total tax. Does this mean that a popular K-pop content platform should pay network fees to overseas ISPs? because it has a lot of overseas users? Civic Group asks, the National Assembly is considering amending the, the Telecommunication Business Act to make network fee agreement mandatory. However, the registration has stored it amid growing public opinion that it should be left to negotiations between ISP and other companies. In Korea, the Netflix Act was inactive in December 2020 following a lawsuit by Netflix, stating that big tech platforms are also obligated to keep internet network safe. Apart from network fees, platforms will be held liable if they cause an excessive traffic and disrupt services. From here, I'll talk about local content. As the Korean wave has become a global phenomenon, global OTTs like Netflix and Disney Plus are investing in Korean local content. They are competing to possess Korean dramas. The government has given more tax deductions to video content produced in Korea. Korean productions are happy. But politicians think that Koreans shouldn't be a content production subcontractor for Netflix. For the sake of more profits for Korean companies, they are not satisfied with the exporting content and want to support for worldwide expansion of Korean OTT platforms. Finally, who should pay for sustainable internet service? In 2020, the Korean government designated 100 megabits broadband as universal service. In any region, telecom companies must provide the internet at the speed of at least 100 megabps to all subscribers. This requires ongoing investment. The number of people using VOD services is growing, and a small number of companies are generating huge amount of traffic. We need to think about whether telecom companies and ISPs should take all responsibilities for the traffic or whether the business that calls the traffic is also responsible. The CEO of Korean ISP, KT, said that in the future, not only VOD, but also AI may cause traffic problem. In the case of local contents, Korea will invest more in contents to maintain the economic effects driven from Korean wave. Global OTTs that distribute Korean local contents are also important, so cooperation is so important. In order to create an environment where everyone makes a fair contribution rather than an environment where someone has to sacrifice, I think there should be more communication between companies like the workshop we are doing today. Thank you for listening. 감사합니다. 아리가도 고자이마스. Yes, thank you, Miss Jo. Oh, so then switch to the Miss Yonetani. Oh, Dr. Yonetani, is it okay? Just a moment, I'll start this your slide. We hope. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm Nami Yonetani. 
Today in my presentation, I would like to talk about the regulatory responses around the world to the rise of global video streaming giants um, with a particular focus on the discussions on local content contribution. And before getting down to the main point, uh, please allow me to introduce myself uh, briefly. Again, my name is Nami Yonetani. I'm a researcher at the Foundation for Multimedia Communications in Tokyo, Japan. This is my, um, actually, this is my very first time attending IGF, and I'm very excited to share my research findings today. So, um, let's move on to our main topic. First of all, I would like to give you a quick overview of the current state of video streaming. Although there are many types of video streaming uh, services, they can be classified into five categories by their revenue model and distribution model. And the five categories are AVOD, FAST, SVOD, VMVPD, and TVOD. And among all of these, SVOD, which stands for Subscription Video On Demand, is leading the global streaming market. And as you can see in this table, SVODs based in the US and Asian countries have a great number of global subscribers, especially the three major US SVODs, which are Netflix, Amazon Prime Video, and Disney Plus, have targeted global expansion since early stage. One of the reasons for their global popularity is their original and exclusive content. For example, Netflix's original series called Wednesday became a global smash hit last year, and it is reported that it has been watched for more than 1 billion total hours by over 115, uh, 150 million households. And various previous studies have shown that such popularity of US SVODs is having a great impact on the traditional audiovisual media industry. For example, in the broadcasting industry, consumers are moving away from pay TV, it's okay, um, from pay TV to US SVODs, which are rich in content and much cheaper. The same thing is also happening in the film industry. Uh, recent studies have discovered that consumers, especially the younger generation, are moving away from the cinema to watch films on US SVODs. Given this situation, more countries are regulating video streaming platforms to counter US SVODs. There are several points of contention, but one of the biggest points is possible unfair market competition led by regulatory asymmetry between broadcasting and video streaming platforms. Um, although broadcasters, uh, although broadcasting and streaming are similar in the fact that they both distribute videos, law tends to lag behind video streaming, which is a relatively new technology. So um, since around 2020, to reduce such uh, regulatory asymmetry, some countries have imposed similar regulations on video streaming platforms to the ones that they have done on broadcasting platforms, especially regulations on local content contribution, which is the subject of this presentation, are being introduced mainly in European and British Commonwealth countries. As you can see in uh, this figure, governments are applying or trying to apply local content requirements such as content quotas and financial contribution obligations, not only to broadcasting platforms, but to but also to video streaming platforms. This table shows you uh, the countries which introduced or are in the process of introducing local content requirements on video streaming platforms. Um, as a side note, as 
Dr. Cho mentioned in her presentation, um, South Korea takes a quite different approach from these listed um, countries. While these countries are taking a um, defensive approach to protect their local audiovisual industry against US exports, South Korea is adopting a more aggressive approach to foster local industry that can compete with US exports. So here I want to point out that there are more than one policy approach towards large US streaming platforms, and my presentation is uh, focusing on the defensive approach taken by the countries uh, listed in the table. And in the next few slides, I would like to share the regulatory discussion in the countries highlighted in sky blue, which I consider to be important and distinctive. We'll start with the European Union, which is the pioneer in regulating local content contribution. In response to the accelerated influx of US content in the, 90, uh, in the 1980s, the European Union introduced the Television Without Frontiers Directive in 1987 with the aim of protecting the European audiovisual industry from the US and required broadcasters to contribute to European works. Subsequently, in 2007, the Audiovisual Media Service Directive, AVMSD, uh, was introduced to regulate video on demand, VOD platforms, and the directive was revised in 2018 to require VOD platforms to contribute to European works as well. Um, firstly, the re revised AVMSD instructs member states to make VOD providers under their jurisdiction secure at least a 30% share of European works in their catalogues and ensure prominence of those works. It does not mention exactly how to give or measure prominence, but it is, it is expected that um, European works should be immediately viewable on VOD platforms. Um, for example, on their home pages, recommendations, and uh, search results. And secondly, the revised AVMSD says that member states may require both domestic and foreign providers targeting audiences in their territories to contribute financially to European works. And um, among all member states, Um, France is the one with the strictest requirements on VOD platforms. France transposed the revised AVMSD into national law in 2021, but with further strict requirements. Moreover, they have their own system called the Media Chronology Rule, an industry agreement on the release window of films which is formed in the government's presence. The latest version of the rule came into effect last February and it was decided that SWOT can distribute films 17 months after cinematic release. However, it may be shortened to six months with agreement of film industry. And in fact, Netflix has succeeded um, in shortening the distribution period from 17 to 15 months in return for extra investment in French films. On the other hand, Walt Disney is raising a strenuous objection to this rule, arguing it's outdated. And they are protesting by refusing to release some new Disney films in French cinemas and distributing them exclusively on Disney+. Plus. In contrast to France, the United Kingdom transposed the revised AVMSD into national law with minimum requirements before Brexit. And after Brexit, uh, they started to explore its own regulatory framework to ensure the Britishness of content 
and announced the draft media bill this March. The focus of this bill is to maintain and strengthen uh, public service broadcasters, PSBs. So what is PSB? PSBs are broadcasters intended for public benefit rather than to serve purely commercial interests and they are granted privileged access to spectrum in return for various content obligations. So returning to the bill, there are a number of proposals aimed at strengthening the presence of PSBs. But one of the most eye-catching proposals is to give prominence to PSB's video streaming services on connected devices, including smart TVs and streaming devices such as um, Amazon Fire Stick. What is more, the BBC has sent a letter to the Parliament calling for a dedicated button to provide a shortcut to PSB streaming services on all television remote control. So the current regulatory discussion in the UK affects not only the video streaming platforms, but also manufacturers. Now I would like to turn our um, attention from Europe to the British Commonwealth country, Canada. Canada is a country of immigrants and a neighbor of the superpower, the US. Therefore, the overriding issue of Canada has always been how to shape its identity as a nation. With this in mind, the Broadcasting Act was amended in 1991 to protect Canadian culture from the arrival of American television. The Act implements the so-called Canadian Content Rule for broadcasters and requires content quota and financial contribution. However, in 2015, the government expressed concern that Canadian content rules on broadcasters were becoming a dead letter as video streaming services grew in popularity. And they argued that uh, they argued the need to support the discoverability of Canadian content. Finally, the Online Streaming Act was uh, passed this April to modernize the Broadcasting Act. And this act uh, will expand the definition of broadcasting to include video streaming in it and apply Canadian content rules uh, to both domestic and foreign video streaming platforms. And now they are currently in the process of public consultation, public hearing to finalize the regulatory framework. Hi. Uh, finally, it is neither Europe nor the British Commonwealth, but I would like to mention Israel. And first and foremost, I would like to uh, extend my deepest sympathies and condolences to the victims and their families in Israel and Gaza. Uh, the situation is um, absolutely heartbreaking. So um, let me get back to uh, their regulatory discussion. Pay TV operators are already obliged to make financial contribution to local content in Israel. And the Netanyahu government, which was formed last November, introduced the broadcasting bill this August to apply the same obligation to video streaming platforms. However, um, there are voices predicting that the government, which is said to be the most far right and religious in Israel's history, might introduce stricter video streaming regulations, including um, uh, content quotas for political reasons in the future. So here in this slide, I wanted to point out that there are possibilities that local content requirements may be imposed not just for cultural or um, economic reasons, but also for political reasons. And of course, this could apply to any other countries, not only Israel. Okay. 
Okay. Uh, the video streaming platforms are, of course, trying to push back against such regulatory actions. Netflix claims a uh, legal compulsion to contribute to local content would be anti-consumer. Firstly, they point out that content quotas would merely encourage spending on quantity over quality and result in mass producing cheaper and low quality works. Secondly, they argue that tweaking recommendations in ways that undermine viewer choice and preferences to meet the prominence obligation would lead to a disappointing viewing e experience. So let's say there's a viewer out there who loves a uh, romantic comedy, but Netflix recommends a zombie film to them, to him or her, only because it's local content. Then it is easy to imagine that the viewer would be less satisfied and may give a low rating to the zombie film. What is more, he or she might even cancel Netflix. So Netflix is saying that prominence obligation would make no one happy, neither the viewers, the creators, uh, nor the video streaming platforms. And thirdly, Netflix insists that uh, the market forces have already made Netflix spend significant money on local content, thus there's no need to legally obligate. Finally, they point out it is discriminatory that foreign video streaming platforms are often obliged to contribute to a local content fund, but are not allowed to use it. On another front, Walt Disney mentioned a new global expansion strategy for Disney Plus this uh, August. They revealed that they are thinking to prioritize markets to make Disney Plus profitable by 2024. Um, to be specific, um, while they're going to continue to invest in local content in high potential markets, they will invest less in local content in mid potential markets and may even shut down Disney Plus in low potential markets. So this means that in some countries, Walt Disney might decide that following local content requirements is unprofitable and shut down Disney Plus. Um, so far, I've shown the discussion in European and British Commonwealth countries, but from now on, I would like to specifically look at what is happening in Japan. In Japan, so far, there has been no regulatory discussion regarding the contribution to local content by video streaming platforms. I hypothesize that there are two reasons for this. Firstly, the regulatory playing field between broadcasting and video streaming platforms is relatively level in Japan. And secondly, Japan is a Galapagos market where broadcasters are not much damaged by US s giants. So let me explain from the first reason. While broadcasting falls under the Broadcasting Act of 1950, uh, video streaming is exempted from the Act. Therefore, I think it is safe to say that regulatory asymmetry does exist between them. However, such asymmetry is slight in Japan, as broadcasting regulations, especially content regulations, are much more relaxed than in other countries. For example, uh, we do not have local content requirements for broadcasters like the European and the British Commonwealth countries. In this sense, uh, broadcasting and video streaming are already placed in a fair regulatory environment in Japan. The second reason is based on the uniqueness of the broadcasting market in Japan. And there are two unique aspects. Firstly, unlike many other developed countries, including the ones we've seen in this presentation today, 
um, pay TV households remain in the minority in Japan. 80% of TV households watch TV via OTA signals, and private-owned OTA broadcasters are the most popular television stations. So this means that there is no direct conflict of interest between popular broadcasters and US SWAT giants due to the difference in their revenue models. Secondly, uh, Japanese viewers prefer to watch local content, Japanese content on the US SWAT platforms. Uh, the table on the left shows the result of a nationwide questionnaire I conducted in Japan in 2021. And it was revealed that uh, people, both young and old, highly prefer to watch Japanese content, especially TV programs and animes on US SWOT platforms. And the figure on the right is from Bloomberg last year. It shows the share of uh, the top 10 programs in major Netflix markets that also appear in global rankings. While the more to the right, the more overlapping their tastes, Japan is at the left end, which means that Japanese viewers have quite different tastes from uh, global trends. And so when US SWATs arrived in Japan around 2015, most of us thought that they would be a significant threat uh, to the broadcasters, to the domestic broadcasters. But it turns out that US SWATs are now just new channels for broadcasters to distribute Japanese content to Japanese viewers. Um, however, does this mean that Japanese broadcasters are able to keep enjoying easy days? In my opinion, US fast platforms, uh, which are gradually expanding globally, could emerge as a potential threat to Japanese OTA broadcasters if launched in Japan, as they are both based on the free advertising business model and thus have a direct conflict of interest. If that happens, some sort of regulatory discussions on video streaming might finally occur in Japan. And that brings us to the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you so much. So the, all the presentation has been done. So just before going to the Q&A, just check the polling result. Just a moment here. Oh, unfortunately, only five are voted Sai, and most of them um, disagree to regulate us by government. Okay. <laughs> hmm. So uh, before going to the discussion, pre uh, we want to know the presenters' uh, polling result or the for the order of the presentation. Professor Jitsumi, please. What's your opinion? I think, uh, thank, thank you. Uh, it's a very interesting uh, presentation of the, all the presenters. First of all, I have to say thank you for all the information. And uh, for the, the questionnaire results, which you uh, presented on the screen, that, uh, I think my answer is that uh, we do not need any regulation on this matter. Mm -hmm. But uh, in, the, in the presentation, I said that uh, Concerning the existence of the externalities, some kind of compensation should be justified in order to make the resource allocation uh, uh, efficient in the, in the market. However, uh, to introduce a government regulation is a different matter because of the concerning the information asymmetry, which the government had to uh, consider when making some regulations, uh, drafting a regulation in this the changing uh, uh, rapidly changing market is very difficult and uh, cause uh, additional inefficiencies in the market itself. So that my recommendation is to ask or to make the negotiation between the actual players 
as much as possible in order to come up with uh, efficient outcomes, how much conversation they should are uh, uh, they need and uh, which side should be obliged to pay the other side. So that uh, uh, in, in, instead of asking government to introduce regulation on these matters, I uh, recommend the government to make those negotiations as easy as possible. For example, that uh, it's very difficult for the uh, small and medium-sized operators to uh, medium-sized network operators to start negotiating with their uh, export giant of the US because that, uh, according to uh, the voice of my friend who is in the business of the small ISPs, uh, they said it's very difficult to start negotiation, to, to st start making contact with their Netflix and their other uh, Netflix and uh, YouTubes. So that uh, maybe that the government can uh, dispatch some expert to uh, start negotiation or to, to start making some contact with their uh, content giant to uh, start negotiating with the uh, uh, efficient terms and conditions of those co uh, compensations. Or they can maybe uh, introduce some uh, alternative dispute resolution mechanism in order to uh, prepare for the situation where the negotiation just broke up. So that, uh, that is my uh, thought about this question. All right, thank you. Oh, it's my turn. I to miss go support the both. <laughs> it's a minor one. <laughs> anyway, oh, the reason is very simple because the money money is essential. And I'm not a uh, content guy. I can't say the word about much about the content, but about the fair contribution. Yeah, as I said in my last slide, the based on the packet charging is important. It will solve the all of the problem. Problem. However. If the purpose of the fair contribution is for the broadband universal service fund, like the, to invest in rural areas, so I could agree it. That's my opinion. So, uh, Mr. Shaw, please. Can you hear yes, me? Uh, oh, yeah. okay. uh, yes, I can hear you. Uh, I think government needs to play a role uh, in helping to negotiate well between companies rather than creating new regulations because technology is developing uh, very rapidly. But it takes time for government to set the regulation. Mm, when the government uh, try to regulate the enterprise on the issue of traffic related to VOD or something, uh, and the need for fair contributions in network infrastructure, investment and maintenance it is the need for uh, need, but I don't think uh, I think it not need a new or a regulation. Just uh, government needs to play a role in negotiate, helping negotiate. All right, you uh, you also none. <laughs> okay, <laughs> how about the you, you know, Um, I think I would vote to the fourth option, content, because um I do think that uh, the government has a role to play to make VODs uh, promote local content. Um. Because I believe increasing accessibility to local content on digital platforms is one of the key elements to develop local digital economy. And it is hard to achieve by market forces alone. Um, we've already seen in the broadcasting market uh, that it is very difficult to achieve content diversity when there's a flood of cheap and exciting US content in front of us. However, I also believe that such requirements should only be imposed in two conditions. Um, first, it should be imposed when the broadcasters are already under similar requirements and there is a need to reduce regulatory asymmetry. Second, the minimal requirements should be imposed on dominant VODs. Otherwise, the requirements would be an unreasonable entry barriers. And in terms of fair contribution to network costs, um, I think 
uh, legally forcing VODs to negotiate deals with local telcos would be enough for now because I'm um, actually I'm not sure if the government is able to define uh, the fairness but um, also I have to point out that some countries are currently discussing to impose public interest requirements on video streaming platforms including VODs. For example, um, some are debating whether to obligate video streaming platforms to distribute disaster alerts. Mm -hmm. And some are debating whether to include video streaming technology to ensure universal access to major sports content. So if such requirements are imposed on video streaming platforms in the future, uh, we would need even more robust networks uh, than we have right now. So um, considering such possibilities, I am open to the idea to widen the scope of contributors of networks, network costs. Okay, so my, your uh, answer is none <laughs> or partially yes to the content. Yes, that, that would be right. Partially. Partially, <laughs> Partially yes, okay. minimal requirements. Minimum mm. requirement. Mm, most, of the, uh, most of the panelists believe the market mechanism, right? <laughs> so uh, let's start the Q&A and, and discuss the sessions. Do you have any comment and questions? Anybody? I'm, oh, Kes name, yeah. Yeah. I'm Keski Kaneyasu from NEC Corporation. So thank you. Thank you for your presentation and discussion. So it's a very informative uh, issue. So I, I, I think it seems to important issue about uh, network and net neutrality. So particularly difficult point is so relation cross border issue and uh, each giant tech issue or computation role or uh, right of no, uh, like uh, access to information or contents. And so a lot of issue. And so uh, I, I know so uh, some country made rule or regulation ongoing. So it's a very so uh, co confusing the, uh, issue. So. Uh, gi give me uh, more um, information so to clarify. So do, do you have any other idea for new regulation to be employed to measure VOD uh, operator like uh, Netflix? Uh, so you're asking uh, new, is there any new regulations for the VOD or do, Yes. Or, or, uh, how about? Yeah, um, thank you for the question. Um, in terms of media policy, I think that most of the broadcasting regulations could potentially be applied to VODs because there's even countries that have introduced licensing um, for VODs. But as a um, global trend, the most prominent discussion currently revolve around content regulations and accessibility rules. Um, in this case, content regulation means prohibiting uh, obscenity and violence and introducing age rating systems for the content. And accessibility rules uh, is uh, requiring closed caption and video description. All right, how about uh, Ms. Cho? Uh, about regulation, uh, in Korea, Korea has a duty to secure internet uh, stability of content provider called the Netflix Act. Uh, Russian platforms and VOD service providers which have more than 1 million users a day and account for more than 1% of total traffic in Korea are also obligated to maintain 
stability in the quality of the internet network. The name is Netflix X, but Netflix has never been a problem. Only a Korean companies failed to comply with Netflix X. So I think um, the regulation is, is possible, but uh, technology is also possible that uh, new technology have already come out and solve the problems, the traffic, about traffic. So I think we, are, we don't need a uh, new regulation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oh, how about the Professor Jitsumi? All right. It, it's a very uh, good question. I think that the, the necessity uh, to, thinking about the necessity of introducing the new regulation of the major body operators. Uh, let's focus on the discussion on the fair contributions. Mm -hmm. So the, the, I start thinking that uh, what happened if the OTT operator or body operators refuse to pay fair contribution to the local uh, network operators. Mm. I think what happened is that uh, the QoS for the uh, local viewers is deteriorated because of the, even if the, they refuse to pay fair contribution to local uh, network operators, they cannot, uh, local operators cannot block the uh, infusion of the OTT content from abroad because of the, there are lots of you know, uh, gateways to the local network. And that is how the internet was designed in the first place, right? So the incentive for the uh, OTT uh, VOD operator to pay the, the fair contribution is required. So that the one, one possible incentive to uh, motivate the VOD operator to pay the fair contribution is to provide them the better qualities, the, the no congestion uh, even in the peak hours or the, the a smaller latency. Figures. So that uh, from the viewpoint of net neutrality, which is my major research focus, this situation is equivalent to providing a paid prioritization to the uh, uh, content providers. So that uh, introducing some uh, regulation to oblige the network uh, VOD operator to pay fair contribution to uh, to on, only the major uh, VOD player to pay fair contribution to local network operators is equal to allowing the fast lanes in the internet, uh, which is, can be a very controversial issue in net neutrality. So that uh, from the viewpoint of policy reason or the cultural reason, it might be good thing for the local government to introduce such a regulation, but from the viewpoint of net neutrality, it's very questionable. And uh, I personally have to say that I'm not a strong supporter of net neutrality, but uh, there is some uh, supporter for net neutrality, and they will uh, have a, a huge discussion against the introduction of the, the, uh, the regulation, which is applied only to the major VOD operator, I think. That's my impression. Oh, all right, thank you. So now you are you're talking about net neutrality, net neutrality around the world and the, some local neutrality in the country, right? No, no, I, I think that in order to uh, motivate the VOD operator to pay the fair contribution to the, some local network operators, oh, I see. there is some in incentives. The incentive can be uh, providing the better quality to the uh, network operators. Otherwise, they just refuse to uh, pay the fair contribution and, and to let the QoS of the services in the local market just deteriorate. Oh, all right. all right, thank you. So my opinion is mm, if the VOD goes to the news, or well, I mean the journalism, the cross-media ownership regulation should be applied. But I'm not sure about such other things. But as I, oh, my feeling is such a VOD has a strong if uh, a strong power to the local local in, local countries. So the kind of the uh, network or the content neutrality should be applied. That's my feeling. Is there any comments? All right. 
Thank you very much. Any other questions? Yep. Okay. Can you hear me? Yep. Yep. My name is Tomohiro Fujisaki from the uh, Internet Society Japan chapter, but here I'm speaking in my own capacity. And my question is about regulations. So I already had some, yeah, actually answer in, in the discussion, but I want to know, so are there any potential drawbacks or yeah, unintended consequence associated with the regulations? Yeah, I know the regulation is very, very strict, and so I want to know the, the side effect of the regulations. All right, thank you. So the bad effects of the regulations, <laughs> anyway. So the, uh, how about the professor, I was called the pro professional of these regulations. First, the decision some please. All right, uh, it, it depends on the, what kind of regulation we are in mind. So that uh, consider the situation when the uh, government obliges the VOD operator to pay some amount of fee to the local networks. So in my opinion, that it is very difficult for the regulator to come up with the exact uh, appropriate numbers, uh, appropriate, appropriate fee level, which the uh, network operators are uh, VOD operator to pay in order to cover the externalities and make their uh, investment up, uh, uh, efficient uh, from the viewpoint of economic efficiencies. So if the uh, government officials are asked by some politicians or the interest groups to come up with the numbers, they have to ask the, the direct uh, information to the uh, operators themselves. I mean, that they have to ask the, the network operators or the Netflix to come up with some figures. So this situation is called the regulatory capture and uh, cause a defined problem of efficiencies. And also that uh, if they come up with uh, some numbers, that uh, it, it can be very high or very low. So if that uh, they have to, uh, I think that they will be more influenced by the local operators and the uh, VOD uh, giants. So that uh, if the uh, regulators introduce a fee which is higher than the efficient level, maybe that the uh, VOD operators uh, Think that this this market is not is a uh, is not a high potential market, especially in Japan, which has the aging population and the lowering income in the long term uh, perspective. That uh, if the government introduced a too too strong uh, regulation on this matter, that maybe the Netflix or the YouTube determined that we should stop you know uh, making business in this country uh, in this country and go out. So that I think that if that happened, that it will have a huge negative impact to the, the Japanese economy. So that the uh, second reason I think that the regulation is not appropriate in this uh, matters. Well, thank you. Go out. Oh, it's a worst case. Anyway, so how about you, Nitani san um, I think the same can be said for local content requirements. Um, if the local content requirements are too high, it may result in higher prices for consumers, and in worst case scenario, VODs might withdraw from the market, uh, which means that consumers would have less choice of content. What is more, it might encourage um, piracy because consumers seek to access content outside the legitimate channels. So um, I believe that requirements should be non-discriminatory and minimal because the ultimate goal of local content requirements on VODs should not be protecting local industry, but to ensure consumers' access to diverse content. All right, thank you. Any comment? Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. So it's uh, the end of the time. So. Any questions more? Okay. Right. Thank you so much. It's uh, Oh, yeah. So I we want to ask the final comment from the panelists. Sorry. <laughs> the, the first one, Mr. Uh, Professor Jesumi. Okay. 
Uh, okay, that, uh, sorry. <laughs> okay, uh, I have to. I don't want to, you know, repeat my previous comments, but I just say that everything should be uh, determined based on the data, not the, the political statement or the emotions. As an economist, we need data. Based on data, we can have a, a more rational uh, conclusion or recommendation to the government. So in order to get some data, I asked all operators on the building player to disclose. <laughs> That's all right. my point. All right. Thank you. Yeah, how about Mr. Show? Oh, yes, uh, thank you for listening. And I think regulation starts out always with uh, good intention, but technology addressed uh, so quickly that another problem always arises. I think there is a need for more uh, governments organization to companies uh, together like this workshop. Uh, I need more uh, negotiation and cooperation if needed. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, in today's workshop, uh, the focus was on VOD. But considering the increasing popularity of linear streaming and live streaming, I think it is our future task uh, to analyze the impact of those new streaming services to deepen our um, discussion. And also, um, as Professor Jituzumi mentioned about net neutrality uh, during the discussion on fair contribution, I thought that we have, I think that um, we have to consider platform neutrality or content neutrality when discussing on local content contribution. Um, I hope we can have an open discussion again um, at future IGF, and thank you everyone for joining us today. <laughs> thank you, it's truly ending. So thank you for coming. Yep. <laughs>